Yeah. <laughs> wow, feel the burn. Feel the burn, yes. Should have renamed it Reburn. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm Tristan Slaughter, and it's weird having the speaker right there. Uh, this talk is Make Rebar Great Again. But obviously, make we can't have, so I don't know a better word you can't than make for this, so just have to cross it out and say, Well, Rebar 3, Rebar Again, Great Again. Yeah, sure. So in this talk, because, <laughs> because uh, last year we gave a talk which introduced uh, Rebar 3 and our direction and how we, where we'd gotten so far. And in this talk, what, I'm, what I'd like to do is introduce some of the changes since that last talk, as well as how you will actually move from rebar two to rebar three, because it's not uh, fully compat. It's not a backwards compatible tool. You almost have to think of it as a completely new tool uh, that happens to use your rebar.config. And I should ask from the beginning if people can ask questions the whole time, please. Raise your hand or shout out. I don't want to talk for 40 minutes just talking. If you have questions, because there are a lot of confusing bits about changing from rebar two to rebar three, and it's really great to have more of a conversation about it. So I don't just because I've been I mean I've been using this for a couple of years, so <laughs> a lot of these things are very quick for me. Yeah. Uh, are you going to be addressing someone trying to transition from Erlang to SKL? Oh, the question is, am I going to be uh, addressing switching from Erlang.mk, and I am not. Uh, uh, yeah, there's not much to say there. It's because it's a completely different tool that it's understandable. You have to learn the new one. Or uh, with re going from Rebar two to Rebar three, a lot of people expect certain things to be the same, and they're completely different. And that's where more of that confusion comes in. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that kind of comes into this slide, uh, addresses that a little bit. So we just had our first stable release yesterday, 3.0, and that means, of course, there's still bugs, but we're planning for future backwards compatibility, so you're not going to you won't experience completely different behavior like if you've been using the alphas and the betas between versions. And we've moved to the Erlang OTP organization on GitHub. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Which is maybe a, a, an answer to the question of why rebar3 over erlang.make is it's becoming the official build tool of Erlang. And so this is the first step, because it's the easiest. We just move who <laughs> owns the repo. <laughs> the hard part is getting it into the OTP releases, uh, which is coming, hopefully, as Kenneth talked about this, this morning in 20, in OTP 20, uh, we'll have Rebar 3 actually bundled, and you won't have to do any extra steps in order to start building uh, complex Erlang applications and releases with Rebar 3. And <clears throat> along with that, I'd like to start with, with just, there's been large adoption already. We only had our first uh, official stable release yesterday, but companies and people have been moving over for quite a while and successfully. Uh, there is some hard work, which is what the second half of my talk is about. Uh, but it, it works. It's successful. People have used it. <laughs> and I really, that's my favorite slide in here. <laughs> Why rebar three? That's the question I get a lot when people find the incompatibility. So it's always important to start with before telling you why you have to change all kinds of 
stuff in your rebar config and the way you develop, because why do I have to change anything? Why didn't you keep backwards compatibility? Why are you making my life harder? I'm trying to, I'm making your life harder for a couple days and then hopefully easier for the rest of your days is the goal. <laughs> we'll see. And a number of issues Rebar 2 had that we set out to solve, uh, an initial one is repeatability. And that's been a, a long problem of not having lock files, uh, not having deterministic uh, build dependency trees. And that comes into play uh, later a lot where people are used to being able to change anything they want and Rebar2 still build it and use it and run it. And we are very strict on making sure that you can't shoot yourself in the foot by making a bunch of changes, publishing something, and somebody else pulling it down. And since they're not using your, your exact machine, it doesn't work, which makes no sense. That's just not helpful. Along with that, we have packages. We wanted to uh, introduce real package management instead of having Git repos for everything. Uh, that is something that obviously could have just been put on top of Rebar2, but I don't think it's necessarily worth it when you don't include the other pieces of Rebar3 that we've introduced, like deterministic building. And Rebar2 had uh, a nice problem of de dependency solution, uh, pollution, where I'm sure we've all experienced it, that you in you include some uh, git package, git repo, and it starts installing mech and edown and all these other dependencies, and you're thinking, I'm not building the docs for this repo. I'm not testing this package. I'm testing my own thing. Why, why are these all being included? We got rid of that with profiles so that only when tests are being run do your projects test dependencies need to be installed. And related to repeatability is Rebar2 had some simply fundamentally broken uh, features that were not going to be easy to fix if you kept the same Rebar2 structure. Well, what Rebar2 does is it steps through the uh, tree of your application and your dependencies and says, I'm here, what do I do? Go to the next directory, I'm here, what do I do? And update depths had a big problem with that because you could actually get different results depending on what depth you were updating. And are you laughing at update depths? <laughs> and it's a common thing that most people just say, everybody knows you just remove dash RF depths and run it again. If, if you want to update a depth, you have to blow everything away and re-get everything. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're going to get. And that goes along with recursive commands, which update depth, uh, that's one of the reasons it was broken, is rebar2 essentially worked like make, and that it would recurse through your directories. And that didn't make sense when you have Erlang OTP, because OTP has a strict structure. And so we can detect what apps are there and what to do for them. We don't need to assume that things are spread out over the file system willy-nilly. Uh, okay, so before getting into uh, how to upgrade, I should, I'm going to talk about what's new since the last time uh, we gave our talk. And one of my favorites is Dialyzer has come to the 21st century and now has colors. And this is actually really useful with Dialyzer. Because you can see right away where it's telling you the mismatches are instead of just having a blob. I mean, obviously, it's not the easiest to read from, uh, from your vantage point. but you get right away in red and green the incompatibilities. And it makes it a lot quicker to read through your dialyzer output 
and figure out what is wrong. <laughs> e unit, why not do it too? We included Sean's uh, e unit formatter by default. Obviously, you can turn it off. Uh, but by default, instead of having to include a secondary thing to make e unit pretty, it by default will output your uh, error messages in a nice formatted way to say, I expected this, I got this, and give you just a nice green dots if it passes so you don't have to see a whole bunch of output when all you want to know is all my tests pass. <laughs> Common test? How can you possibly make that pretty? <laughs> <laughs> This is also one of my favorites, uh, along with dialyzer, of simply printing the test case, the suite, and the test case inside the suite, and an OK if it passes. And if it fails, we do the same formatting. If you were using eUnit asserts in your common test, it will format it to give you a, a proper error message of what it expected, what it got, instead of uh, just mismatch and all that stuff. Yep. Will this prettifying fail if some of these tools change their output format? Text. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because it did the kind of a plug in, plug in to the tool. Oh, directly into common test and e unit? Because then it would follow the format of that tool. Yep. I mean, that's sort of the great thing about us working together to get rebar 3 in OTP is we hopefully will avoid that future by coordinating and having these actually included. So this was, you know, these tools existed, people uh, wanted uh, these features, let's bundle them in and see where we go. And now working with the OTP team, hopefully we won't end up in a future where, oh, now your tests just put out gibberish because the format changed and we can't handle it. So yeah. Uh, we have another number of new plugins since the last time we spoke. Uh, back then we said to just use make if you wanted. Oh, yep. Especially not right now. We're not being included in OTP yet. That when you are. what? But when you when are. You are. <laughs> Details haven't been worked out yet for <laughs> all this. But we can at least uh, uh, make sure that when we give out the new version of OTP, we have a rebar working together with that. Yes. Yes, they will be tested together. So OTPs and rebars will be tested together when releases are made. Uh, a C compiler plugin was added. Uh, same configuration as rebar 2, which makes it a lot easier for people moving over. You simply include the C compiler plugin, and it works the same as you'd expect as long as you hook it, which I'll show in the converting uh, to rebar 3 slides. Cuttlefish is, <laughs> so Cuttlefish is an interesting one. Uh, this plugin's purpose isn't simply to make Cuttlefish work with Rebar 3, but to make Cuttlefish something that you just simply add right away to your release and it works. No, yeah. What is Cuttlefish? Oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> 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 so instead of uh, writing, so people who have done releases, you know, you have your app or sys.config and you have your vm.args, and those are the first sys.config, app.config is Erlang terms, which is fine for us, but when you're, you know, releasing Reoc to uh, non Erlang developers, they don't want to open up. 
an Erlang term file and start editing it, they would like a simple line equals what value you want to set for that configuration. Much more user friendly uh, configurations. As well as it includes uh, types and translators and it verifies that what you've set, like if you say that this configuration type, this configuration key has to be an integer and someone puts a string, you'll get a, a user friendly warning instead of a Erlang crash dump. And, but there was problems with it of usability even from an Erlang developer standpoint. And if you used node package from Basho for building releases and packaging them into Debian or RPMs, you, you, you would get a lot of uh, usability out of that. But anything else, it was problematic. Uh, it was, documentation was tied to rel tool and uh, node package and Re relix and rebar three. It just, it, it was a lot of work on the developer side to start using this when it shouldn't be. It should just be something you should be able to configure your VM and application in a user-friendly way without having to jump through a bunch of hoops. So what the Cuttlefish plugin does is it will auto-discover your the schemas that exist in your project instead of you having to manually set up overlays to copy them. And it will create your start script that runs Cuttlefish when your release is started. And it takes care of uh, all that bundling together when you create a release or a tar. And what we did is added project plugins to Rebar 3 to support this. So what it's able to do as a project plugin is actually overrides the release command. So now when releases run, because we have project plugin of Cuttlefish, release goes to the Cuttlefish plugin which passes state on to the rest of uh, the provider, the, the release provider. So the Cuttlefish running gets done seamlessly inside your release and you get the result without having to touch anything pretty much except adding your Cuttlefish uh, plugin. And we've got many more new plugins since last time. Uh, quick check which I had to include uh, what it outputs when a test fails because that's great. <laughs> of course, proper app ups if you want to generate app ups, rel flow for actually uh, dealing with app ups to rel ups to having this whole synchronized flow of doing deployments and release generation. Now I can get to how you're actually going to, if you haven't done so already, move from rebar two to rebar three. First thing you've got to do is delete a lot of stuff. So you get rid of your eBin directory. We're not just dumping beams into the current working directory. Uh, get rid of your depths directory. Both of those are gonna screw things up if you leave them. Uh, that's one of the common first uh, problems people have experienced. They start running it and rebar three gets confused. Uh, obviously remove dot rebar. And you should only have to add underscore build to your ignores files. What we, the goal is that everything that's generated is under underscore build. And that way you have one thing to exclude and you have one thing that you can blow away when everything goes wrong and you need to start over. <laughs> Next, you should probably move some of your depths. You probably have dependencies in your depths list, list that don't need to be there. They're not build dependencies. The test and the docs um, profiles are built in to rebar three. And so if you run common tests or eUnit, it automatically uses the test profile. So it will automatically get uh, mech in that case. In this case, it will download and get mech. If you run the edoc command, it will automatically get e down because it's in the docs dependency list. So you're going to find 
everything's a little different because we got rid of the top level eBIN, we got rid of depths, everything's under build, and under a profile. You have the build directory, a profile, and then, for example, your specific application that you're building is under lib, is still under lib, the name of your application eBIN. All the libs, including the dependencies in your application itself, live together in this directory. And you don't need to do any finagling with subders and libders. I don't even know how those work in Rebar2, really. If you have uh, an apps directory or a lib directory where you want to have multiple applications, because we've based it around the fact we know what an OTP application structure looks like. We can figure it out for you. You don't need to tell us. So if there's an apps directory that has multiple apps under it, Rebar3 finds them, builds them, and takes care of the rest. You don't have to tell it where they are. This is an important one. Oh, yes? Um, so the build directory is similar to the mixed one. Did you actually incorporate the build to custom home structures? Uh, they're actually slight, they're different. Like their default profile is dev, ours is default. They actually still have a depths directory where they put all the depths that are fetched. So, I mean, small things. Uh, probably should have coordinated maybe, but didn't. <laughs> ended up with a, because underscore builds actually been used a long time uh, in build tools, so. Turned out nearly the same, but different. So with repeatability, this is very important. People often, one question they ask when they've moved over to Rebar 3, I edited one of my dependencies modules and I'm not seeing the change when I run it. Like, well, yeah. You told Rebar3 you want dependency at version 1.0, and if you change something, that's not dependency 1.0. So obviously it shouldn't use that, which becomes understandably frustrating when you're trying to test changes really quickly. You want that, but you want to still preserve repeatability. So we added a checkouts feature which is simply if there's a directory underscore checkouts and you can link to or copy an application into it, and if that application is in your depths list, it is now treated similarly to a project app as in it's built every time you run build, unlike dependencies, which once they're built, they're built, it's done. And you get those changes, but it's removed from your lock file and it includes a specific step in creating the checkouts directory and linking to the app to make sure that the developer is acknowledging that I am breaking repeatability right now. This relies on being on my machine, and I know that I've, I'm being bad, and I will fix it <laughs> when I'm done with the changes and publish the checkout app and change the version and things like that. There's been a number of changes to EUnit and CT to make them uh, hopefully more seamless and more pretty as I showed earlier. And one being you'll notice that your, when you run tests, they create a new profile under the build directory so you have the default in the test. But if no URL ops change, nothing is rebuilt. So it's not that you have to rebuild everything into a new profile, it's simply linked to in the default profile. And so weird directories like .eunit are gone because we have these test profiles. You'll want to check your app.source, especially if you're building releases or if other people are using your application to build releases because they're going to get mad at you if you don't put your runtime dependencies in the .app source file when they build a release and your dependencies aren't included in the release very annoying, which also surprisingly, people started finding circular dependency problems because we don't allow that. And the, the, the .app file is partially used to construct the build order of all the applications. And so circular dependency, we can't build it at that point. Uh, so make sure, yeah, don't have those. <laughs> 
because a number of features have been moved out into plugins where we did not want to include them in the core, we want a solid core for building OTP apps and releases, you're likely going to have to add some plugins and hooks. For example, if you were the developer of E-Level DB, you would add this to the rebar config file in order to tell it that you need to use the port compiler, PC, which is fetched from hex. And oh, another difference from rebar two is uh, plugins. That is actually the, speci the specifying what dependency to get, not just the name of it. In rebar two, you put the p uh, plugins in your depths list and then just the name in plugins. But here, that is actually everything it needs to know in order to fetch the port compiler plugin. The artifact tells it what is expected to be built. So Rebar 3 is able to know if it successfully built your app. We don't, we don't try to do much understanding of what your project should create except for the fact of OTP applications because those we know what that looks like. We know what it's going to look like after it's been built. But outside of that, when you have C, you tell us what needs to exist. Obviously, this could be for anything. Artifact is generic. It's just this file needs to be on the file system after our application is successfully built. And add it to the hook. And that's a typo. That should be compile, not compiler but it'll run the port compiler before compiling the rest of the application. Overrides are if you don't own the repository, the package for what you want to use, but you really want to use it and you don't want to fork it. A common annoyance both in switching to rebar three from rebar two where projects weren't compatible like rebar, like E-level DB relied on the port compiler being part of rebar two. Or if simply you end up wanting to remove a certain dependency or some, something else from a project that you're using and you, don't, you end up forking it. So we end up with a whole bunch of forks on GitHub that are just changes to the rebar config practically. With overrides, you're able to tell rebar Use this instead. So this works if you include E-level DB as a dependency in your application where the E-level DB still depends on being rebar two. This will take care of adding what I showed before into the build process of E-level DB. Another fun one is converting to RelX, which should be a simpler tool to use, but when you're, you've grown old with a rel tool and you've created your, your life around it, it's hard to switch because it's a very different beast that's easier to use, but when you want to do something uh, different and you've already done it in a rel tool, it can be a pain to get back to what you expect to be the result. But this is what you should get in the end. This is an example that actually is using uh, Cuttlefish as well as RelX, RelTool to RelX to show how much simpler even the Cuttlefish part is. In the RelTool example, we have to put a lot more information that should be just defaults in many cases. And we have to copy all kinds of, we have to copy the Cuttlefish e script, we have to copy uh, Node tool, we have to template out the, um, what actually starts it, what the schemas are, and in Rebar3's case in RelX, all that is handled for you. You just have to tell it the name of your application, assuming all your .app files are correct with the dependencies. Uh, we have a dev mode which simply links to the applications instead of copying them so you can have a quicker build and whether or not you want to include ERTS and the overlay VARs are used in 
uh, in this case, particularly for cuttlefish, because sometimes there's overlays that have to be replaced in the cuttlefish configuration, but other than that, you don't have to do anything for cuttlefish to be working. And now that you've done that, you, can, you should publish your package to hex. The plugin for that should be included in your global list of plugins or in your pl project plugins. That way, if someone depends on your application, they don't get the rebar three hex plugin as, like it's a build dependency, which makes no sense for if you're just depending on someone's. And you can get more information on uh, the hex PM website. I, of course, have to give a whole lot of thanks to the many people that made this possible. Uh, Fred and Alistair, James and Hines, who is going bald because of Rebar 3. He finds all the bugs and rips his hair out as he finds the bugs. He's one of the best debuggers I've ever known. And of course, Erickson and IUEG, UG, to, for we're getting rebar three, hopefully, to the masses by including it with OTP. More questions? Yes. Yeah, you tell them to upgrade. No, I'm <laughs> I, I should have actually. Yeah. Now you bring up a slide that I meant to include, and I didn't. I hate that. Uh, <laughs> what people have done uh, is in rebar config.script, you can have it check if rebar 3 or rebar 2 is being used and modify the config based on that. Uh, Hackney is a good example to look at for how to do that. And it's a bit of a pain, but it's a good uh, it's a good thing to allow people to adopt as uh, their needs allow it. Any other questions? Yep. Is it possible to run uh, private hex repositories or mirrors? Yes, and it will be easier. Right now, it's not exactly something you. Uh, it's not documented. Uh, but that's coming. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I just tried to use Rebar 3 and failed just because the uh, underscore build directory, instead of opting to underscore build directory is a homework. And, um, you know, writing the pass. Yes. Right, Fred, you wrote shell. So. <laughs> Thank you.